Hi, I'm Chris Kanish, and this is CS361, Systems Programming. Today, we're going to do a little bit of a live demo of how dynamic memory allocation works and how we can get started on homework then. So, uh, what I have here is a very basic program that uses the same memory allocator that we're going to be using in homework four, but rather than doing it within the testing harness of main.c, here it's simply a piece of code that is going to use it. So what we see here on line 18, we're initializing that malloc allocator, and then we're going to be using it. Uh, I wrote some helper functions here where I'm going to malloc and print something. And this is one of the first kind of tips that I would give you when you're writing a program where the output, like what gets printed to the screen, isn't the primary task that you're that you have to deal with. What you're dealing with here is a bunch of bits that are stored in locations in memory. And in order for you to know whether it's correct or not, you have to come up with some tests of your own. You have to print things to the screen that show you that your understanding of what's going on matches with what the bytes are in the memory. This is where things get a lot harder than they are in earlier CS classes. But a lot of the times when you're dealing with pieces of information like this, it's not going to be straightforward how you can figure out whether something is correct or not. You're going to have to start testing it on your own rather than just running it and seeing that it compiles or doesn't crash or any of those good things. So uh, first thing here, we got that M and P function. And what I'm going to... So another thing that I want to talk about the differences here, and this has a lot to do with what we've been going over in chapter nine, as well as how this specific allocator works. Malloc, the version that comes from glibc, is a lot more complicated than the version that we learn about in chapter nine. It mallocs things into different places. It uses mmap. It uses separate heaps, all of this stuff so that it can support higher performance programming, so that it can support multiple threads. We're going to see in the next chapter all sorts of stuff that we wouldn't normally be seeing in our normal, just basics of understanding how a dynamic memory allocator works. So the first thing that I'm gonna do is compile this code and GDB it so that I can see what's going on while that process is running, because we're gonna to have to look at the internals of the memory to get a better idea of what's going on. So let's GDB our example. And I'm going to place a breakpoint right on the last line of the entire file, right there on line 28, and I'm going to run. The nice thing about this is that everything that has happened here has happened. The memory has been manipulated the way that this program works, but the process hasn't exited yet. So we can come up here. We can look at all of our processes and find the one called example. And that is this one. So I'm going to copy this, and I'm going to that prop this uh, maps. And what this shows us is the memory layout of this process. Remember, when the loader works, it brings things in from the disk according to the way that the loader and the ELF file format tells it to. And here is not only what the loader tells it to do statically from the file that is saved there, it's also showing you everything that got loaded dynamically as part of running the text of that program. So you can see things like the text, the read-only data section, and the read-write data section here. But then the really interesting things come after this. So we see that right after, the very next byte is the beginning of the heap. And if we are to malloc something that's relatively small inside of regular system malloc, we'll see that that pointer exists on the heap. And what's really, really useful when we're using GDB in this assignment is that once you load your program and you stop at a certain point, you can run whatever expression you want. You can manipulate things. You can print things out in lots of different ways. And that's going to be super useful to kind of figure out how things are working and the way that the memory looks while you're manipulating it. So the first one we want to do here is pmalloc ptr. So this 603260, that right there is on the heap. That's part of what is in that heap area. But what you can see here is that this other stuff, these things that were malloced using the synthetic allocator are nowhere near that, right? They're in the 7FFFF65, blah, blah, blah. You can see this is in the memory mapped region of memory rather than in that very beginning where all of the things loaded out of the executable and the heap end up. So what we see here is that malloc is much, much more advanced than the allocator that we're writing. If it sees a really small 
allocation, it'll just put it right there on the heap because that's going to be the most efficient thing for it to do. But if it sees a very large allocation that's going to take up maybe several different pages, it's just going to say, you know what, rather than trying to deal with fragmentation and coalescing and all that stuff, this is a really big allocation. I'm just going to ask the operating system to give me a bunch of pages that will allow me to give the user exactly the amount of memory they want, and it's going to be nice and efficient. In fact, we can even come out of GDB and we can S trace example, and we will see the M map that happens here. So the earlier ones are starting the entire system. And then we're going to see break here is actually enlarging the heap as that process starts running. But this M map here is malloc asking the operating system, hey, I need a certain amount of space for this allocation, please give it to me. This is actually the 20 megs that the internal allocator asks for. The internal allocator asks malloc, we can see in the mem init function, it says, I want the system malloc to give me 20 megabytes of space. I'm gonna use that as my pretend heap that I'm going to grow and shrink using my pretend S break. But in this memory model, we're asking for this full 20 megs. We get the full 20 megs and we use it however it is we want to use it. The important thing that I want to go over here is that we're not going to worry about end mapping things in or having all these fancy free lists or multiple lists for multi-threading. None of that is necessary for our allocator. Our allocator is purely single threaded, nice big free list. We're going to do first fit, nothing special besides coalescing and in our case for homework four, garbage collection. So the next thing that I want to look at here is you know, what does all of real memory look like when we start using one of these dynamic allocators? So if I come back into my GDB and I break on 28 again, I'm going to run and I'm going to get there to 20. So what has happened here is I allocated four ints worth of space and I set every single byte there to the ASCII value uppercase A. I malloc five times four, so 20 bytes. I put a bunch of Bs. I malloc 24 bytes. I made a bunch of Cs. I freed the second one, created the second, created a new chunk of memory, and put a whole bunch of Ds in there. So actually, let's do something a little bit more fun. Let's start this over and break on 25. So that means before we run line 25, we are going to pause. So we are about to free that pointer. And the first thing that I can do that is going to be really, really useful for this assignment and also for understanding just the way that all this memory works is to examine all of that code. So let's see if I can remember this. I want to, I want to examine memory and I want to start at PTR. So if I just say examine PTR, it's going to say, oh, PTR is a pointer to an integer and I am going to show you what is located at that. This effectively dereferences PTR and shows you the data that's stored there. If I instead wanted to just print the value stored in PTR, I would just uh, type P PTR for print. And that will say, okay, this is what's stored there. And again, any expression that I want to use in C will work right here. So if I say P of dereference PTR, oh, first off, that's a void star. So that means it's a pointer to a generic piece of memory that doesn't have a type associated with it. So if I want to print something there, I would have to explicitly say, this is an int star, and it will print it out for me. That is not the same thing as X4141411 on our, on our screen. But if we say instead that we want this to be printed in hexadecimal, it'll show us exactly what we expect. So we are able to, to look at memory. So not only can we look at that memory, look at that one individual integer, I can examine the 100 different elements starting from PTR. And so this gives us 100. Let's make something a little bit shorter. Yeah, so if we look at 40 different elements that are in this case, starting from PTR. So what this is going to do is going to print out all of the bytes that are stored in memory, starting from that location for 40 void stars worth. So that's 40 uh, four byte chunks worth. 
So we've got for the fourth, there should be 10 lines here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yep. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Uh, and this shows us the thing that was returned by math. And we can see that we memset four times four, 16 bytes. So we memset 16 bytes to 4141441. A little aside here, using uppercase A to figure out what's going on in memory is like a security type thing when people are trying to manipulate code and find exploits and vulnerabilities in it. A lot of the time what they'll try and do as a very, very first step is to just try to write straight uppercase A's into memory. Because if you're flipping through a whole bunch of just hexadecimal gobbledygook, it's very, very unlikely that a real program would store 4141414141. But it's relatively easy for you to spot that if you're flipping through lots and lots of things. You say, oh, okay. If I was trying to manipulate memory arbitrarily or outside of where I'm supposed to go, this is how I can notice that my manipulation was actually successful because I see this very unlikely string of characters. Here, we're not trying to exploit anything. We're just using that same approach of, oh, hey, look for something that is not going to show up in that code. So we see that these 16 bytes are set to 4141. And then we start seeing the way that the memory allocator works how it stores all this information. Uh, now, first off, we're seeing the very beginning of the allocated set. So that's the mem pointer that you give back as the return value of malloc. But it'd be more interesting if we look at the bytes starting before that. So if I look at four bytes earlier than that, I can actually say, oh, here is the header. Remember, the headers are four bytes. So void stars, you, when you do math on void stars, it's just going to add one minus one. So PPR minus four is four bytes earlier. And now we see here's the header that is set to 19, which is x18 plus one, because that block is allocated. So if we do our math, x18 is the decimal 24. So that, that entire block is 24 bytes big. That means that we get 16 for the allocation and then four before it and four after it to get a total of 24 bytes in the entire block. So not only do we get 18, hex 18, decimal 24 bytes, we also know that that lowest order bit is set. Therefore, this block is allocated. So if we go forward eight hex 18 bytes from this beginning byte, we end up at this beginning byte. And all of a sudden, we are at the beginning of another block. At that other beginning of a block, we're gonna see roughly the same thing. We're seeing hex 20, which is decimal 32. So 32 bytes plus one bit to show that it's allocated. And this also makes sense because if we're saying five times size of int four is 20, we round 20 up to 24 because we're gonna be allocating an even multiples of eight. So we're gonna get 24 bytes for the allocation and then four bytes before, four bytes after it comes up to 32. This level of verifying that what I understand is what I'm seeing on the screen is excessive, like super excessive for the purposes of getting started on this assignment or just coding through something and working through something on your own. But keeping track of what your understanding is and what you're seeing in memory is super, super important when you're not going to get really trivial results out of did this work or did this not work. Now we see we got our Bs all set into here. We, and then another interesting thing we see here is that there's nothing at this point. Remember that we went up to an even multiple of eight and therefore there's a little padding. So in the earlier lectures, when there was that padding at the bottom, this is an example of that padding. Then we get our end point, our beginning point of the next one, our end point of the next one. And then this says, okay, go forward F to FA8 to get to the next end of that chunk. So that's very, very far away, rather than just you know 20 bytes, 30 bytes, whatever have you. That I believe if I say one ten pages worth, we're gonna get through all the way through. So FA8, what's FA8 plus 06C? FA8 plus 06C, so 014, so 4014. We get down to 4014. I think we have to look at this many bytes. So we, we probably got 4096 bytes back from the allocator when we first did an S break. So if we go forward 
4096 bytes and change, we should see that header and the footer that corresponds to this FA8. And remember, this does not have a one in the ones place. This is an even number, therefore the lowest order bit is zero. And that is what, because this block is free. Let's go all the way down to the number we're looking for, 4014. So 401C, so there, there is our footer of that FA8 size free chunk. And here is the header of the next chunk. You can see here that it is marked as a chunk of zero size and it's marked as allocated. This is the special header that means that this is not a real header. This is a pseudo header that is the epilogue block that says this is the end of what we have allocated. If you want any more memory, you have to ask the operating system for it rather than asking the memory allocator itself to just give you memory directly. Cool. So the next thing that we want to see is let's work through to line 28 and then we're going to free something. So let's do a print again, just to remind ourselves what we saw here was allocated 16 bytes footer, allocated 24 bytes footer, allocated 24 bytes footer, and then unallocated. We're going to free something, and then we're gonna allocate another two integer block, another eight byte block, and then we're going to memset that. So let's see what that looks like after we run. Now we're gonna inspect that same amount of memory. So here we realloc this one. It has D, so that's four one, four two, four three, four four. So where are the four fours? Where are the four fours? Okay, they're right here. So here we're seeing that we have taken this block that was already used and then given back to us via free, and then we just give it back again. And not only do we give it back again, but we have to split it into two different chunks. So this pulls them apart and turns them into two smaller chunks. What is interesting here is that we do overwrite this set of bytes. So this set of bytes used to be the 4242-4242, but super importantly, all of the bytes that were set otherwise, besides the header and the footer in this chunk, are going to just have whatever values they add at the start. This is really, really tricky because just like with the stack, if you get memory from malloc or if you get memory in a local variable in C, it is not guaranteed to have all zero values. And I see a lot of people when they end up with kind of tricky bugs that are they're having trouble figuring out what's going on, they didn't reinitialize a variable after they started a new stack frame. And so it just has the variable from the old time. And usually that kind of works. And that just makes things much more tricky because if your program doesn't crash or it does something weird or unexpected or it crashes 30 lines later, like what the heck happened? But when you actually trace down that issue, very often it's because you didn't initialize your variable. But that's just a very common mistake for rookie and veteran programmers alike. So we've got our old garbage data in here. We have our new data that we had set based on what we asked for. And so if we ask for another, say eight bytes, we will probably get a pointer to this byte right here. So this byte right here is probably, so it's 304C minus four. That would be 3048, I believe, eight. 9A, B, C, yeah. So 3048 is probably what we would get back if I say mm, so I'm gonna print mm malloc of eight and see what it says. Yeah, so 3048, we did, we got back 3048, which is a pointer to right here. So that's that's what we expect. So again, what we think is going to happen and what actually happens is exactly the same. So I, I highly encourage go back through and rerun these commands with the VS Code Lectures C code and convince yourself that things are working the way that you expect them to. I will have this code pushed before this video goes live. And, and just as a quick reminder, if we were to dereference what we got back from that return value of mm malloc, it's not going to have a bunch of zeros in it like other newly allocated memory does. It's going to have all those 4242-4242s in it. So let's say the int star, we're going to print in hex 
an instar version of the return value from four. These dollar sign are kind of shorthand for what was returned in that previous expression, so we don't have to set it to a variable. And yeah, we end up with all the 4242, So I have allocated that one. If I X my memory, rather than seeing a 10 here, ask yourself, you might want to put, pause this video and say, what are you going to expect to see here if I run this again? What will have changed? What else might have changed? Things along those lines. Did, did this change? 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 All of that stuff. Like, try and figure out what it's going to say. And it says 11 here because much like the previous chunk, this is an eight byte chunk that is allocated. Therefore, it is 16 bytes total because eight plus four plus four on either side plus the one bit to show that it's allocated shows up as hex 11. So the next thing that I'm going to motivate how it is we're going to start working on it is the isPTR function. So if I recall correctly, it's void star isPTR, void star input. I'll just call it whatever I want. No. So it's going to look a little bit like this. We take as input any pointer. So it, a really good thing to do, especially in this situation, is to say, okay, I have all these addresses and I have all these values that are stored in these addresses. Can I as a, and this is the heap. Remember, this is, this is the heap. And beside the, the footer for this one, this is effectively all the information we need to talk about the heap itself. So if I want to say, rather than talking it through in code, I just want to say in English, in a few different examples, can I run the isPTR function just out loud myself to know conceptually what it's doing rather than how to do it? And hopefully I would say yes or no. So if I had a memory address, it has to be between the beginning of the heap and the end of the heap. So p mem p row is this value. So 301c, that makes sense. And the then the high, that is 401f. So that is x1000, aka 4096 bytes away. We have only asked for one page worth of memory. So if we were to get a value like 7ffff65e501f, that would be outside of memory pi, and therefore it wouldn't be a valid pointer at all, no matter what. But if it's in between those two values, what I want to return, remember from the definition in lab eight, I want to return a pointer to the block header itself so that I can manipulate it the way that I want to, to do my mark and sweep functionality, right? Because if any pointer within that entire array of bytes that was returned is still reachable from someplace else, then that entire array has to be assumed it is reachable. When you see in memory that something is stored, say, the, this long value, 7FFFF65E302C. If you see that value stored in memory someplace, then you know that somebody, and, and it's stored in, say, the globals, then you know that somebody could still potentially find this byte of memory. And if they can find this byte of memory, anything within that allocation is fair game. That's kind of a simplifying assumption. So like I was saying, how do I do the isPTR function? So if I was given the address of this byte right here, I know that I would want a pointer to this. I would want a pointer to 301C. If I was given this byte, I know I would want a pointer to that beginning of that chunk. If I got a pointer to, say, this byte, I would want a pointer to that chunk. If I got a pointer to this byte, I want a pointer to that chunk. So fundamentally, what I'm doing here in my head is I'm finding that address and then I am going backwards or forwards until I find the header. But that's a problem because I know how big these are right now, but if I had a whole bunch of random integer values here that I didn't expect because I'm only a library, I'm not actually knowing what that individual program is doing, I would have to do a lot more than that. I would have to say, okay, I know that I'm working with this byte, but at the end of the day, the only way that I can find out what chunk this is in is to say, let's walk through the entire heap, chunk by chunk, and find when we go from the address of the chunk header, or the chunk header, this, the address of the chunk header is smaller than the address of the memory pointer in question to the address of the chunk header, 
going to be this one, is greater than that. So that means that if the first time we see that the chunk header pointer is greater, the pointer value is greater than the pointer in question, then we know that the previous chunk is the one that has that thing in it. So that is going to be the return value that we want from is PTR. So if I know that I was looking at, say, 308C here, in GDB, I can set a variable by saying set um, maybe we PTR to be, I'm going to, I want it to be the address of, say, this byte. So that's going to be this whole big thing. I think I can paste it like that. So P, maybe PTR. And we want to print as X. Okay, so yeah, that is our hypothetical pointer. Now, the first step we want to do is say, is it between men heap low and men heap low and men heap high? Well, that's pretty, pretty simple. If we just want to work through these expressions, we can check. Uh, let's say maybe PTR is greater than men heap low. True. Fantastic. And we want to know that it is less than men heap high. Also fantastic. It is inside of the region that defines our active heap. It is potentially a pointer. So if I dereferenced some long value and that value was this integer, I don't know that it's some gigantic integer. It's much more likely that it's a pointer to this region of memory. Like what are the chances that some random counter was exactly the thing that is the address that we were using at that moment in time. So if either of those weren't true, I would probably bomb up, but instead I can keep going. So we, we know that maybe PTR is greater than memheap low, and memheap low is the beginning of the heap. I'm not sure if that's how you're supposed to call it in the assignment, but we're just gonna use memheap low because we know that that's where everything starts. So if I want to find the next chunk header from that chunk, what are we going to do? We are going to print men heap low, and we're going to dereference that uh, in star. Yeah, so in star men heap low, let's see. 19, okay, so hex 19, that's what we want, right? That's interpreting that piece of information as a integer, and that's exactly what we want to happen. So this is what we would be doing if we were writing our C code, if we wanted to just talk about that. But we need to mask off that lower order bit because regardless of whether it's allocated or unallocated, we only need to jump forward that many bytes in memory from where we started. So we want to mask that with, so we want and, and not of zero x one. So I want to print this, that should be 18. Okay, fantastic. What we did here was we made a nice big long bit string of all zeros and then a one at the end, and then we inverted that. So it's all one and zero at the end. We and that through, and that gets rid of whatever is in the low order bit. If the low order bit was zero, it stays zero. If the low order bit was one, it turns into zero. And now we can say, okay, this is how uh, this is the size of this chunk. Now, this isn't going to be exactly how you want to do it when you're marking and sweeping. Because here, I know the only thing that's going to be used in those three low-order bits is the allocated bit, not necessarily the mark bit that you're going to deal with when you're doing this assignment. So if I know that's how big it is, and I know where it starts, then if I add that to mem heap low, I should find the pointer to the next chunk header. So. Let's see whether that is the pointer to the next chunk header. Print this again. So 3034, 3034. So if we're starting at this 301C, we dereference it, we get that number 19. We mask it off and get the hex 18. We add that hex 18 to where we started, and that will bring us to 
the next pointer to the next chunk header. And so we see that our next chunk header is 3034. If we start at, this is 2C, 2C, D, E, F, 0. So this starts at 3030, and then 0, 1, 2, 3. Then this one starts at 3034, which is exactly the number that we are looking for here. So we've iterated one step through this entire linked list by finding that size, jumping forward by that size, and now we can do the same exact thing. We're going to interpret that piece of information as a integer. So we want to say 3 or 3 4, so that's 1, 5. And we want to add it to the value itself that we started with. So the same thing we did before, rather than man heap low, which is kind of our beginner, the beginning of the heap, we're instead going to start with men start with wherever we had left off previously. So this would be plus 15. And this should give us 3044. 3044 is this one. Same thing as the previous one. That brings us here. And what memory location were we looking for? We wanted to say 305C. So what we were supposed to be doing here that I forgot to start doing was checking to see whether that value is greater than the value in question. We want to see we want to see whether the maybe pointer is less than the new chunk header because if it's if it becomes less than the new chunk header that like we always start, we start with the chunk header is always going to be less than the maybe pointer. So it's less than less than less than less than less than and it becomes greater than and we say aha this chunk header for this part is not the right one. It's the one previous to it. So if we do px of so if we want to test whether 15 is less than maybe bpi. We're going to get true. So we still haven't found it yet. So the sunk header is still less than the maybe pointer. So let's see about 17. That's the next one. Also not true. So let's do a px of 17. And it off plus 17. So we, we dereference. The value stored at 17, whatever 17 was, so this 3044, 3044 is here. We dereference this rather than talking about it as an address, we talk about it as the value stored at that address, going from the L value to the R value. And then we find a new pointer. I want to test against 20 because 20 will be the next pointer that I care about. So 20. So 20, which is 3054, is still less than, maybe pointer is 305C. 305C is less than 3054. 305C is still greater than 3054. That makes sense. What about 3074? This one is probably where we're going to see zero. So now we see that 22, which was 3074, 3074 is going to be this header. This header is too far away. This, we have jumped past the byte in question. So if we jump past the byte in question and we keep track of our previous header, or we just go in and use the footer and do some subtraction, although keeping track of your previous iteration is easier in your code, this is the chunk in question that has the byte in it that we cared about. And I, I believe you're using 305C as our example. Yeah, 305C. So this, if we did this algorithm out by hand, just like this, we have decided, oh, it is in this chunk someplace. So 305C, as we see, is in that chunk. So that is the way that you can work through this using GDB. You can also work through this using print statements, but I find that 
especially when we're manipulating memory like this, it works out so, so usefully that now that I know how to manipulate the bits and how to add and how to subtract and what I'm trying to do, I go from English description of what I need to do and just doing it out loud my, myself without any precise definition of how to find it. And then I just run a bunch of expressions to figure out how to get from point A to point B. And then if I have that one example of how to go through the entire thing, I can take that and turn it into the code. So I'm not gonna get it started here on the left side of the screen right now, but you should be able to take these pieces that we used right here and write your own is PTR function that returns the previous pointer after we find the one where the potential pointer has become greater than the chunk header address in question. We still have to do those bit masking and the way that I did it here is not the way that you're gonna to wanna to do it, but there's a relatively small change from what we did here to what you're gonna to wanna to do in the assignment. So that should get you started. I would highly recommend working on this because as with the last assignment, the concepts from this assignment will be tested on the exam. Have a great day and I'll see you next time.